Hi, I'm Colin Ross. I'm a psychiatrist, born in Canada, grew up there, did medical school, psychiatry training, was a hospital-based university teaching hospital psychiatrist for six years. And then in 1991, I moved to Texas, where I've been ever since. And I've had a hospital-based trauma program in the Dallas area 30 plus years now. And for 20 years, I also had similar programs in Michigan and Los Angeles. Just before the lockdown hit, literally the weekend before lockdown, moved from the Dallas area to Austin and now have a partial hospital program, intensive outpatient program uh, that I run myself here in the Austin area. I'm a past president of the ISSTD, got about 360 or so peer-reviewed papers published, 35 books, and one of those books, which is one of my favorites, is Trauma Model Therapy, and Naomi Halpern is a co-author on that. So what I'm gonna talk about here for a little while is an idea that's not in any of those books. PTSD as a disorder of the future. And I had an amazing amount of trouble getting a paper about this idea published. And the reviewers were saying, well, where's your data? Where's the evidence? And hey guys, it's an idea. I'm not saying that it's scientifically proven, it's sort of a clinically useful perspective. And apparently that doesn't pass in psychology, psychiatry journals these days, compared to the field of physics, where there's a whole, the top layer of physics is theoretical physics. Nobody said to Einstein, where's your evidence that E equals MC squared? So it's a completely different attitude. The theoretical guys who do no experiments, have no data, are like at the top of the heap. Whereas in psychology, you're just some sort of flaky speculator or something. So that's a little side comment on the ills of the field. And the idea here is just practical, useful therapy perspective. So if you look at PTSD as a disorder of the future, that doesn't mean you have to do CBT or EMDR or this or that. It's not about the specific tools, it's a perspective. It opens up another domain to talk about process, think your way through with the client. And so if we look at the history of PTSD starting 1980, which is DSM-3, uh, 1994, which is DSM-4, uh, 2013, which is DSM-5, it's evolved somewhat. So the it's called Criterion A, which is the traumatic event. Criterion A has gotten broadened over the years. Uh, basically what happened in 1980, going back for five years, was a whole bunch of people working in the Veterans Administration system in the United States with Vietnam vets, created, developed, and got PTSD into the manual in 1980. So it was very murder mayhem kind of a criterion. You had to have threat of dying or serious bodily injury. And if you didn't, it wasn't PTSD. Well, this clearly is not the way reality operates. So the 1994, it's now broadened. It includes sexual abuse as a child. And then in 2013, it's broadened even more. It can include witnessing trauma happening to somebody else or hearing about trauma inflicted on a loved one. So the traumatic event is broadened and the criteria set is broadened. So uh, 80, 94, was very much fear, hyperarousal, adrenaline overdrive, and so on. There was a complex trauma concept introduced in the late 80s, really, by Judith Herman, which is PTSD isn't just the flight response, fear, anxiety, hyperarousal. It's got a whole lot of other dimensions to it. So severe chronic trauma causes relationship problems, self-regulation problems, depression, anxiety, all kinds of things, anger. And everybody's been aware of this in the clinical arena, but it hasn't really gotten accepted until recently in the research academic part of the world. But it is in ICD-11 now, complex PTSD. And if you look at the criteria, DSM-3, 4, 5, without accepting complex PTSD as a concept, they've gradually broadened the symptom domain. So in DSM-5, regular standard PTSD, includes hyperarousal, anxiety, fear, flashbacks, nightmares, negative mood and cognitions, 
affect dysregulation, all kinds of uh, self-regulation problems. So, quotes, regular PTSD now looks a lot more like complex PTSD. But still, it's post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. So my little clever comment is, uh, that's no good. We should rename PTSD, PTSD, because PTSD is clearly a better name for PTSD than PTSD. Meaning what? Well, it's called post-traumatic stress disorder because the entire orientation of the field is something happened in the past. We're now post the trauma and we've got a lot of stress symptoms. So it's post-traumatic stress disorder. Completely makes sense, but it misses half the picture. I think PTSD should be called PTSD. It's pre-traumatic stress disorder. Oh, actually, in fact, both perspectives are true. They're not mutually exclusive. And this is a way of looking at things that I learned from clients. So I remember a military guy that I worked with. Uh, this is not Vietnam, this is out in the Middle East. All kinds of combat trauma. And the trauma, which I heard about from quite a few guys that I worked with, is somebody died on my watch, a civilian or a buddy. This particular guy, without going into the details, he held himself responsible for the death of somebody under his command, which in fact was absolutely un unpredictable, not under his control, not avoidable. And so he had himself, like with great intensity, basically court-martialed as a war criminal. And the sentence was death. So he had himself on death row. That is, he was very suicidal. And it wasn't sadness or depression. It was active, angry punishment of this criminal who was actually just a courageous soldier. So that was part of what we worked on. But the other part is he's now back home for a number of years. He's got a family, kids. He's in a pretty safe neighborhood by U.S. standards. And there's no imminent danger to the family, to the kids. But he's hyper vigilant, always checking up on them. Where are they? What are they doing? When are they going to be home? And every night he gets up and patrols the perimeter of his property, multiple times armed. Why? There's nothing's going to happen in that neighborhood in the middle of the night. There's no objective threat in the present. And so I talked to him about this and he explained a vow he made to himself back in the Middle East. Nobody will ever die on my watch again. And I went, oh, oh, okay, I get it. You've taken this vow and you've brought it back home to the civilian environment. Nobody will ever die on your watch again equals your kids. He goes, that's right. He says, but your threat assessment is off. So when we talked about, here's the level of threat in combat, here's the level of threat today. You're in hypervigilant, scramble all the jets mode way out of proportion to the actual level of threat and look at the price your kids are paying and so on so the point here is that sure it's about the past trauma but his focus is actually on the future what's going to happen to the kids when they go today tomorrow i gotta to patrol the neighborhood i gotta be safe something might happen in the future and so the purpose of the flashbacks is to remind yourself of how you messed up before. I shoulda, coulda, shoulda, coulda, shoulda, coulda. If it's a civilian rape victim, a woman, I shouldn't have gone to the bar, I shouldn't have worn the lipstick, I shouldn't have left my drink while I went to the restroom. There's all the shoulda, coulda, shoulda, coulda. And then what you get is hypervigilance flashbacks. The flashbacks are replaying the tape, seeing where you messed up last time. You're not gonna mess up like that again in the future because you're going to spot the red flags that you missed last time. Most of the time, it's actually totally impossible. There was nothing to spot. It was unpredictable. So it's all magical child thinking, I have the power to see and predict the invisible. But when you're in that magical child thinking, which we all do when we're traumatized, then you've got to stay hyper alert, scanning, looking for danger all the time to spot the red flags, take evasive action, and protect yourself in the future, not in the past. So therefore, PTSD is a disorder of the future, which then leads to, oh, we need to talk about that. Tell me what you're thinking and feeling about the future. What are you doing to try and reduce your risk in the future? And the person could be 
like if it was a date rape situation, there's actually objective things you can do to try and stay a little safer. You don't invite the guy back to your apartment. You don't go in his car to whatever location. Another example is from the uh, Chile mine disaster, which I forget when that was, about 15 years ago or so. There's 50 or so guys down in the mine for many, many, many days, like 50, 60 days. Amazing engineering feat where they basically created an elevator by drilling through. Everybody came up, everybody was fine. Uh, they were very dehydrated and lost a lot of weight down there, but they were okay. A couple of guys, their wives left them. One guy in particular, he's back home, he's not physically hurt, and he gets a whole bunch of basically concrete blocks, cinder blocks, and builds a wall all the way around his property. Okay, how is that going to prevent you from being stuck in another mine disaster? Obviously, it has no objective benefit or use whatsoever. It doesn't repair, cancel, help you recover from the mining disaster PTSD. It's all about this unnamed thing that the horrible, bad, evil world and your bad karma might send at you, like an invader or somebody with a gun or a robber. Or if you build a wall, you're safe. It's all again about staying safe in the future. It's not, quotes, rational, it's not objective. Completely understandable emotionally. Of course you feel horrible about being a trapped, overwhelmed, helpless victim who almost died, but now you've got the power to make yourself safe in the future. And the question is, what's the price you're paying in terms of hypervigilance, scanning, danger, not trusting anybody, paranoia? For what objective increase in actual safety? So from a cost-benefit point of view, it's just not worth it. The price you're paying is way too much. So that's PTSD as a disorder of the future, which doesn't like cancel the past perspective. It's just another dimension to look into, to discuss, to talk about, to process in therapy. As I said, with whatever tools you know, work for you. So that's PTSD as a disorder of the future. Thanks for listening.